It is director number 92. 92. That is... <laughs> okay, this is good. This is good. Uh, we worried about the first one being maybe a bit too low-key, but I don't think that'll be a problem this time. 92 is John Waters. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a 180. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, wow, that's great. What John Waters have you seen before, Rob? I forget. I've seen uh, Cecil B. Demented. Uh, what was that other one? Uh, the Housewife Murderous. Oh, one. Serial Mom. Yeah, I think that's it. Serial Mom and Cecil B. Demented. Okay, so that's a pretty yeah. broad sort of tranche of things that that it could be. I think we should probably go for like an earlier one and a later one. Do you think that would be? Yeah, I think the later one's are probably better known. Well, maybe, and, yeah. But with John Waters kind of doesn't obey conventional logic, does he? <laughs> no, he is a natural phenomena that scientists have yet to get to the bottom of. Hello, my name is Rob Simpson and welcome to Directors Uncut. If this is your first episode, we put filmmakers from all genres and all corners of the globe onto a huge list that covers everything from Japanese cult directors who never quite got the international break to genuine canon greatest of all time Italian directors. Then we turn it into a lottery of directors by using a random number generator and whatever number comes out of that hat myself and a guest host discuss them and their work through two films this episode is from the patreon archive um, it was originally recorded in february 2021 so maybe there's some references throughout the show to that but nonetheless, if you want to get the Patreon archive now, there's a link in the description. You see, this week I have been joined from Horrified Magazine and his very own pop screen podcast. Graham. Hello there. The first episode was classy. Yeah. I mean, listening back to the first episode, we do a lot of saying, oh, the, the films are much darker and seedier than you'd expect. Yeah, we didn't know we were born listeners. Yeah, I mean, episode one, Robert Hamer. Oh, classy, ealing, British institution of a director. Episode two, <laughs> I don't know if it's possible to get my opposite, but we did. It was John Waters. International treasure, John Waters, in my opinion. Hmm. And uh, <laughs> he is. I've not seen a lot of his films, so should we sort of talk about our expertise level before we, we jump into anything? I think so, yeah. I've also got some feedback from Facebook about what our listeners think of John Waters. David Wood politely says, I can't remember laughing harder at any film than I did at Female Trouble. So quotable. I was delighted when Cry TV released it last year. The Christmas Day Cha Cha Heels rant is gold. Also, my friend and I still say N instead of no. <laughs> That's how you know a movie's had like a real big impact. It just affects the way you say little things. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this is also, I guess, a great effect that John Waters has had on someone. Ashley Lane says, I will always remember his great advice. If you go to someone's house and they don't have any books, don't fuck them. <laughs> that's, that's very John Waters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I don't really know how to follow that. <laughs> in, in terms of our own level of expertise, as you say, I, I've watched quite a few John Waters films. I was of the opinion, until recently, that John Waters' only five-star masterpiece was John Waters. <laughs> uh, yes, because but you found his other... I, I might have found his other, yes, but we, we'll get on to that later on in the show. Um... I love him so much as a personality and the joy of his films largely is that so much of that personality bleeds into the movies. Oh, of course, yeah. Um, there's a theory which I've long had. Mm. Um, it's the people who make Disney movies are the people who you should be wary of and it's the people who make the most subversive, disgraceful and disgusting movies who are actually genuine sweethearts. Yeah. 
And there's, there's two watermarks for that. Uh, Shinya Sukamoto, who's just genuinely lovely. He, If you don't know his name, he made Tetsuo the Iron Man, mm-hmm. which is not a nice Disney movie. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is John Waters, who I'm getting deeper and deeper into. Prior to the this episode, I'd seen um, Cecil B. Demented and Serial Mom. Mm. And it was just teetering on the edge of me thinking, you know what, I really like this guy, but it just needs that sort of elbow over the line. Yeah. And I think um, over the, the, the space of these two movies, that, that nudge has happened. Oh, fantastic. That's excellent. Yeah. It's not the nudge way you'd expect either. It, it, it's very uncharacteristic for me to pick this one as sort of a I'm a fan now mm. sort of a movie, if you will. So which one do we want to start with? Last time we started with small scale, ended on big scale. Should we start with the one that is maybe more characteristic of John Waters? Yes, that would be uh, the earlier one. Because I, I didn't know prior to this, but uh, he is, well, he basically started making movies in his backyard with a lot of people in the Baltimore area, subversives, uh, outsiders, mm. and whatnot, through the 60s. And I think this one that we're talking about, so 1970, yeah. is the last of his I'm doing it in the back garden with my pals sort of model of movie. Yeah, I mean, the ones after this still had the Dreamlanders, as they're called, still had his regular acting troupe, but he was able to afford a few more sets and he didn't he didn't have the problem that he had on the film he made before this one, which I think was Roman Candles, I might be wrong, uh, where the police arrested them while they were filming. Ah, <laughs> oh, John, John, John. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, enough, enough beating around the bush anyway. It is a multiple 1970s multiple maniacs. Yes, which is surely, surely the trashiest film ever to have a Criterion collection entry. If it's not, it's something else that John Waters did. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. And earlier John Waters, maybe. Yeah, I think I'm going to leave, Lady Devon. Oh, Mr. David, how wonderful. You're wonderful, yeah, but she'd kill you on the spot if she knew. Or else have me arrested or something. That's so cruel of her. What could she have you arrested for? Hundreds of things. There's hardly a law I haven't violated at some time or another. I mean, she'd just make one up if she wasn't satisfied. Why can't we just go to California or Mexico? She'd never find us there, and then we could have each other. Oh, but she would find us. We wouldn't even get a hundred miles out of town before she'd have the police out. Oh, why do we have to go through all this? I don't care where we go. Please, Mr. David, let's get a room upstairs so we can perform acts. Um, I feel lonely without you, and I miss you. And all you ever do is talk about Lady Divine. I hate her. She's making you miserable and me miserable. Let's kill her. Shh, quiet. Keep your voice down. This place is crawling with cops. She has spies everywhere. She'll be notified. Um, but how to describe what it's about? Um, well... Lady Divine mm-hmm. runs a group which is full of subversives, weirdos, um, maniacs, as it were. And they've got this little sting where they have a show and they'll invite people in to see all of this stuff, see all these perversions, see two gay people kissing. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an interesting segment, that, because it kind of shows a lot of the hang-ups of 1960s America. Yeah. But uh, after that, things change and... Uh, plot comes a bit looser. Mr. David, her boyfriend, wants to break away and have a new relations or do acts with a new woman. Yes, thank you for saying acts. I love the use of the word acts in this movie. <laughs> and Lady Divine has, how can we describe it, a, le- a religious experience in church. I mean, you know that something <laughs> is going down when the credits to a John Waters movie end with... And George Riggs as Jesus Christ. Yeah, I was wondering where that was going to go. I, I didn't expect there. <laughs> I'll be honest. And uh, I mean, I'm sure Divine said something similar during the filming of that scene. Yeah, <laughs> and the uh, and the last scenes is something. I'm not going to spoil <laughs> that because I mean, even if I said what it was, you still wouldn't really see it coming. Yeah, yeah, no one would believe you if they hadn't seen Multiple Maniacs. So, yeah, that's Multiple Maniacs in a nutshell, I guess. Yeah, 
And it's one of those films where, I mean, everyone talks about comedy as a very subjective art, but I think if you're watching something like Some Like It Hot, you can at least say that there are objectively things that work here, that it's well acted, yeah. the cinematography is good, you know, the, the it's, it meets the basic standards of the movie. Multiple Maniacs is, I think, mostly in focus. Yeah, there's a few <laughs> bits where it loses it. <laughs> So it really does live and die, even more so than any other comedy, on how funny you find this. You can't defend it by a sort of good movie standard. Oh, no, because it is not good by any sort of normal human metric. Yes. It's it's horribly acted. (laughs) The dialogue is badly delivered, uh, out of focus. It makes no sense whatsoever. (laughs) But somehow... I'm not going to say I liked it because it, it kind of doesn't want you to. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, it's it's kind of oddly endearing. I think so, yeah. And I think that kind of quote-unquote badness is in many ways a saving grace of it. I think if you had a scene like, say, the the one near the start of Divine shooting the audience member, if that looked any more realistic than just someone falling over and going... Ugh it would just be kind of sour and mean-spirited. Yeah, because yeah, the gun, it feels like one of the guns you get to shoot ducks at the county fair. <laughs> it does, yes. It probably is. It, well, yeah, that's fair. Because I think I read this was made on £5,000. Something like that, yeah. Which is meagre no matter what era you're doing anything in. Mm. So they get quite a bit out of that. Completely, yeah, yeah. I mean, biblical scenes, you know, Mel Gibson had to have substantially more money to film The Passion. <laughs> and uh, a prop creature, I guess, is the best way to sort of talk around it. Yeah, again, they tease it in the opening credits, but I, I don't want to go fully into that because if you've seen it, you know what it is. And if you haven't, you'll appreciate the surprise. I don't know what it is about it. I mean, why do you find it funny? Because I just wasn't picking up on that humour element. I don't know. It's kind of an odd gra- thing to grasp, really, because it's, it, it's kind of crude and before it was a fully formed John Waters. Mm, yeah, uh, it certainly is crude. I think in Waters' case, there are two things that always save him from... Because I'm not a big fan of gross-out comedy. You know, when when it was yeah. big in like the 90s and the 2000s with the Farrelly brothers and all that, it just wasn't interesting to me. I think with Waters, there are two things. And firstly, as I say, is the fact that you can see the seams in it. You can see that it's play acting. You know, you can see that it's it's just a bunch of friends having fun. That makes it endearing. Um, the other thing about it is I genuinely think he's got an ear for, like, everyday strange turns of phrase. I mean, there are things in this that should not be funny but made me laugh quite a lot. I love okay. Mary Vivian Pierce's line towards the la- start. After we've already seen Divine, you know, kidnap and murder a bunch of screaming hostages, uh, she says, that Lady Divine is not a friendly person. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about the grand understatement of that that I adore. Yeah. And uh, it, the character as well, Lady Divine is such an odd creation. Yes. I mean, she's got to be one of the earliest drag characters in American cinema. I think, yeah, unless you unless you count stuff like, you know, some like it hot, which is a very different kind of plot motivated take on it. Yeah. Yeah, if it was played for uh, gags there. I mean, Lady Divine is a character, mm. an absolute character. I mean, it, she run through a good number of uh, John Waters movies. Yeah. But um, I'm not going to say it's well acted. Every time she's on scene, she has such a presence mm. that you can't look away. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like on a sliding scale with like uh, Pam Greer's. I mean, Pam Greer's wasn't a good actor, but she had a magnetism yeah. that you could not, you know, fail to pay attention to. And I think uh, Divine is exactly the same. I think with Divine, it's that kind of declamatory dialogue delivery you can tell that so much of this is written for divine yeah i mean it's all around her basically Hmm. Uh, it's even the sequence the biblical religious sequence cookie muller as the virgin mary has completely forgotten about that (laughs) 
it's it's such an odd sequence as well because it's sort of she believes that even though she goes around killing people, um, killing cops, stealing, doing all sorts of probably illegal acts in public parks. <laughs> yes, she believes she's never done anything wrong. Mm. Yeah, she's earnest in the fact that she is on the right side of everything and this religious sequence is sort of an extension of that Mm. and the earnestness of what she's delivering and what she believes it's a bizarre sequence and it it, it culminates in something even more bizarre and it clearly john waters was he had a big stick and he wanted to poke a bear (laughs) yes because this was uh, the, oh, it will surprise no one to hear that there were many John Waters films that were subject to censorship over the years uh, this is kind of unique in that it's one of the very very few films in Britain that has ever been censored on the grounds of blasphemy oh, well I can see why Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of clear but... but yeah up until I think it was about 2005 I think it, when that uh, religious right group tried to prosecute Stuart Lee over Jerry Springer the opera they did it under blasphemy charges and it backfired so badly that the High Court actually decided there's no reason to still have criminal blasphemy as a legal offence now uh, so yep yeah, 10 out of 10 that works well um, <laughs> but yeah up until then that whole church scene was cut out of British prints of the movie the Criterion release is the first time it's been uncut in the UK that had cripple and it wouldn't make I mean it doesn't it exactly doesn't make, make sense, sense now but taking that out it's like a good 10 minutes yeah yeah and it, 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 she has like a girlfriend at the end of it yeah and that uh, her appearance would just make no sense whatsoever yeah I don't know exactly how they did it because uh, it is, as you say, it is tricky. The film is sort of done in blocks, and you get the sense that a scene is there to showcase one of John Waters' obsessions. And as soon as the, yeah. the plot moves on, it doesn't sort of progress like a plot should. It just moves to the next obsession. And yeah, yeah. that's one of them, and I can't understand how it would work without it. So the rape before it and the child leaving her to a church is okay, but after that... All great, no. yeah, everything fine <laughs> where's, there. Where's, where's the line? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, 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 it's kind of hard to enjoy because it's, it's such a massively amateur production, so it's kind of um, getting the headspace, mm, really. Yeah. I think it was you who said before, uh, you said Terence Malick, the best way to experience him is sort of start at the beginning. Because he only ever becomes more malick yeah. Yeah. I don't think it really works with John Waters. I would agree, yeah. I think, I can't remember the first one I saw, but it was definitely one of the later ones. Uh, and I am a big defender of the later ones. I know some people consider them compromised, but I think stuff like... Uh, Pecker or The Dirty Shame are still really funny films, but I think they are easier to get into. Yeah, because the, the more accessible, the more polished to them. Not in a yeah. polish in the sense of all the edges are, are, are sanded off, because the one thing that John Waters will always have, he's nothing but edge. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. So you can't get rid of that because you get rid of who he is. Mm. But there's, I think it's a sort of A few years before he became a bit more of an accomplished director, I think, uh, Multiple Maniacs, there's there's essences and shades of what he would become, Hmm. but it's just sort of like a very, very, very low-budget, amateur, experimental project, really, at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that goes back to my my statement that John Waters' masterpiece is John Waters. To me, there is no real difference between watching a film like Multiple Maniacs, reading one of his books, listening to one of his talks. You know, you are getting the same experience in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, his character comes through completely in this. And you certainly can't defend it on the grounds of, you know, brilliant cinematic invention, because it, as we've said, it's a completely amateurish film. It just depends on whether his sensibility is, is funny to you or not. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, the early Peter Jackson as well. I think it was uh, a bad taste. 
Could be is... bad taste, brain dead, meet the feebles. All that yeah, I think it's bad taste. He, he, it took four years for him to make it, and he's basically making it by messing around with effects with his, his friends in the backyard. Yeah, yeah, that was bad taste. It has that sort of... This is not a filmmaker. This is just someone having a go at filmmaking. Mm. The, the filmmaker aspect of it comes a little bit later. Yeah, I would in agree. In body of work. Yeah. yeah. But they're both endearing, and they both have that a huge amount of personality searing through them. And I think the other thing with multiple maniacs is, uh, as you hinted at earlier with the reaction to the two men kissing, it is a v- really interesting time capsule of, like, urban America at the start of the 70s. I mean, yeah. one of the things that made me laugh at one of the people they have in Lady Divine's cavalcade of perversions is a pornographer and his girlfriend. And it's like, you think this is right at the start of that time where, you know, things like Deep Throat and The Devil in Miss Jones were playing in legitimate American movie theatres and people were talking about porn being chic and respectable for a bit. Well, this is not porno chic. This is very much in the opposite direction. No, no. <laughs> and there's other parts of that as well as like a puke there, which fair enough, it's just porridge. Yeah. But, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you can't expect that. Of John Waters, come on now. And the other one, which I thought was a little bit awkward, really, was the the drug addict going through withdrawal symptoms. That's a very dark joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, really dark. Turning that into like a point of entertainment, or oh, point of entertainment, or farce for him for uh, Divine to steal from them. It's quite weird, isn't it? That it shows you that there was this point in history where. A heroin addict going through withdrawals and two guys kissing were considered roughly on a level. Yeah, that's a good point. That that's it's very much a fantastic time point. I think it was 1963. This is supposed to symbolise, if I remember correctly. I think I popped up somewhere in this. I think I might have just. Mal- Oh, I might have just melded together a load of facts looking at John Waters. You might, <laughs> yeah, you might have temporarily had a blackout while watching it. We've all done it. I mean, it's it's. It's just part of the multiple maniacs experience. I mean, this isn't the one that want me, pushed me to completely go through John Waters' filmography. Mm. But I think this is kind of like his apprenticeship, really, isn't it? Yeah, I think if you can find something to enjoy in this, you're definitely a John Waters fan. It's the personality, really. I mean, if you, can, you get an essence of who the guy is, what makes him tick, his really salacious sense of humour. Mm. Yeah. Once he can actually express those a little bit better, you know. And if you appreciate it on a micro amateur level, or whatever you want to call it, mm. you can certainly appreciate the bigger budget and more con- considered uh, later films. Completely, yeah. So shall we leave that as a cliffhanger? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so got you little piece. <laughs> Before we look at what happens in the next episode, if you've liked what you've heard so far, please do consider subscribing wherever you get your podcasts from. And if you have a few minutes to spare, please give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. That helps immeasurably, as does giving us a rating on Spotify. Or if you don't particularly want to do those things, just share the latest episode on social media. Either way, it allows new ears and eyes to find us, and that's very, very important for a podcast that's just taking its first baby steps, like directors on cutters. But yes, I'll use this section in the future um, to I'll read your feedback, in the sense of if you've got a comment to make about any of the directors that we've covered from Toshiaki to Yoda to Robert Hamer to Federico Fellini like we did in the last episode or John Waters like we're doing today I would very very much like to hear from you so please do fire an email to directorsuncutpod at gmail.com that's directorsuncutpod at gmail.com now the next episode is going to be a Patreon episode um, if you want to check that out, details in the description. I can announce now happily, because we did it in the previous episode, that it is going to be Lee Chang Dong, uh, director best known for his breakout film uh, Burning, that he did a few years back, 
Beyond that, I can't announce who follows that. All I will say is it's our very, very first two-parter. Um, but I can announce what will be the next episode to make the migration from Patreon to the main feed. And that is going to be French realists. I guess he's a realist. Jack Audiard, who's best known for work on Rustin Bourne. And I guess a prophet. He's also done other things too. Um, surprisingly, he's not particularly well known for the movie he won a Pandar with. Uh, well, Pandar for uh, Deepan. He, 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 he won a few years back. As for what will fill that blank, that gap, check me out on social media at underscore RJ Simpson. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. And I'll be making that announcement there via a nice little headliner video with all the subtitles and that. So, without further ado, I'm going to jump out of this middle section and hand things back to myself and Graham from February 2021, where we're going to be continuing to talk about the irreplaceable, one-of-a-kind John Waters. Like, hi, cats. Sit down. You got the fuss chasing you? No, we were... <sighs> you, you guys are real beatniks. Just like New York. Daylights are coming and you want to go home. You two checkerboard chicks. What? You know, black and white, salt and pepper. Well, yes. I'm a checkerboard chick, I guess. Whoa. Whoa. <sighs> I'm an integrationist. Yes. We shall overcome someday. Not with that hair, you won't. You look like a hair hopper to me. I mean, your hair is really uncool. How do you get your hair so straight and, and so flat? With an iron, man. I play my bongos, listen to Odetta, and then I iron my hair, dig? I think we better get going now. The coast looks clear. Let's do some reefer. We'll get high and I'll iron the chick's hair. Reefer? <gasps> Drugs? Loco weed. When I'm high, I am Odetta. Let's get naked and smoke. Cool. Don't breathe it in. You'll be addicted. The latest is the later. Much later. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through... Okay, so we uh, jump into our second movie. Let's do a bit more John Waters, yeah, because, I mean, we vetoed Pink Flamingos pretty early on in the process for this, didn't we? Yes, because I... I don't want to be catching on the on the shitty thing saying it's kind of infamous yeah. and it, it's sort of somebody walks in and says oh my god what are you watching <laughs> and, and that's just the perfect scene for that to happen in. yeah so we vetoed that i think multiple maniacs was as, as close as we could get to that end of john waters now as far as you can get in the other direction is our second film which is hairspray the 1988 original version of hairspray Yes, not the one where the recast Divine is John Travolta and... Uh, oh. I'm still not sure how I feel about that, yeah. Oh. That's a backfire, <laughs> if ever there was one. And is that, I'm assuming that's the role where this has since subsequently become a lot of stage shows and you get like Phil Jupiter says, if you're listening overseas, that's a overweight, annoying comedian <laughs> who made a, a career out of saying Stephen Fry is posh. Yeah, yeah, he did, didn't he? Yes, yeah. Yeah, it, it's that kind of thing. Um, Hairspray the Musical, I looked this up, premiered in 2002. And it was made into a mu the musical film in 2007. But this is right at the start. Yes, before all that. And this also could have featured in a Grimm's other podcast, Pop Screen, because one of the cast members is Debbie Harry. Indeed. Which... A small role, but she's definitely there. But um, how can we describe this? Because there's a lot going on. It starts off as one thing, and then it totally changes its spots. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
It starts off as a a pretty nice film about a suburban dance contest in Baltimore, which goes out on television. Uh, It's the Corny Collins show. All of the kids in the neighbourhood want to be the featured dancers on the Corny Collins show, but... As Edna Turnblad, the uh, daughter of Divine and Jerry Stiller, uh, goes through the process, she finds that the Corny Collins show has a dark secret, that it's segregated. They won't allow black kids to dance with white kids. And she leads the vanguard against that in ways that... uh, in ways that meet some resistance from Debbie Harry, who is the villain of this piece. With possibly one of the most amazing haircuts or hair... So good. ...things, I guess, <laughs> in, the, in the final act. Hair sculptures. Yes. Yeah, but this is genuinely so charming. Um, I mean, it's not the sort of thing which I would even remotely like, because you can see how it had become a musical. I don't like musicals, but you can see where the, the connective tissue is. Mm. But it's just so likeable. I mean, Ricky Lake in the... It took me a while to figure out it was her yeah. at the start because she's so young. Yeah. The beaming smile that she has in her face and just how likeable of a personality that John Waters created for her. It's just the film flows through her and it's just genuinely... You can't help but having a smile on your face. And I think it goes back to that thing which might have been hard at spotting multiple maniacs but is still there, which is that for all of the sort of dirty jokes and the bad taste, the John Waters universe is basically innocent. You know, Edna's father, the Jerry Stiller character, owns a joke shop which sells like fake vomit and fake dog poo. And that sort of teaches you how to read this. Everything in this film, even the harshest stuff, is on the level of a fake dog turd. It's just like harmless vulgarity. Yeah, because there's a character played by John Waters who's basically hypnotising... Is it Edna's best friend that she actually likes white boys? (laughs) Yes. And his his method is he's got a sort of big spinning spiral on a board (laughs) on the end of a stick and he just twizzles it around in her face. It's wonderful. And there's a a scene with uh, Edna's best friend. I really should remember that name, but Edna's best friend. Penny Pingleton. Yeah. She goes to the black uh, suburb (laughs) and her reaction is played for laughs. You know, she's just screaming at every black person in the the neighbourhood and all the black people are laughing at her because they think she's insane. Her reaction to a black cop might be the hardest I've laughed in months. (laughs) It was so good. But it's it's also a genuine reaction that people would have had at the Mm, time. So it's played for laughs, but it's also incredibly dark-hearted. Yeah, and I think that that was a part of me that thought... All right, I enjoyed Hairspray, but I watched it, like, back in the noughties when I was younger. You know, can a sort of big-hearted, goofy comedy about American racism really land the same way right now? And fundamentally, it does. I think it carries off that, that sort of... That trick of using mockery to disarm bigotry in a way that a lot of more prestigious satirists have kind of... Oops you know, upended themselves doing. I mean, the only uh, exception to the rule, really, I'd say, was um, Chris Morris with Four Lions, who I think was expert in the way he deconstructed the way things are looked at through the, the racist lens. Completely, yeah. But I think there's a lot of particularly British comedy from the noughties where the implicit punchline is, of course, I don't believe this because I'm a man on television. And you think, well, n- now that isn't a solid assumption anymore. Now you absolutely can be a racist and be on television, so the joke doesn't work. But that's not a problem here, I think. Yeah. Um, going back to sort of the idea that John Waters was an evolving filmmaker, mm. this is uh, really rather well made, to be honest. Yeah. All sorts of things. I mean, the 90, I think it's like 1963, so it's very much... 1950s style. Yeah, it's the uncool end of the 60s. Yeah, the bopper style music, the people on TV shows with slick back hair and, you know, all American diners. Mm. This is very much 1950s ideal, but it's almost perfect in its recreation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing that hit me is that even though this version isn't strictly a musical, 
when you get to see the Corny Collins show and when you see the dance numbers, they're captured so cleanly and unfussily that, you know, it, it would shame an actual full-on musical. It's kind of a shame that he never did a musical, to be honest, because yeah, he has it in him. Yeah. yeah um, other aspects of it as well, sort of in the, the craft, um, it's just little scenes throughout it which I particularly enjoyed. Uh, mm. There's a scene in a big girl shop oh, yeah. uh, which she becomes like a, a figurehead for and does an advert. Yeah. And the advert as well is just... it's. It's a small little scene, but it's just one of these scenes where Ricky Lake really gets to shine. Yeah. And it's that beaming face. I can't help but make you sort of... It's, it's infectious. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that it's Ricky Lake too. I mean, what what better qualification for doing <clears throat> a talk show than being in the middle of a John Waters film? Nothing's going to shock you after that. She's been in a few as well. Yeah. It's kind of like one, one of his uh, one of his troop. Yeah, she was Which, in Crybaby. I know that much. Um, and yeah, and like she was others. in Serial Mum as well, yeah. one of uh, the daughters. I'm always a bit disappointed when someone in a John Waters film is just an actor. Like, I want them to be like yeah. a drag queen or a talk show host or a performance artist or one of the Manson family or Patty Hearst <laughs> or. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, there's actors in this. I mean, uh, Jerry Stiller's probably the biggest mm, name. Yes. Uh, ben Stiller's dad. But he's not got a big role. Not really. What I love about that Jerry Stiller performance is how absolutely sort of straight he plays the idea of being Divine's wife. Like, there isn't a nod or a wink to the audience in that at all. The actor who plays Divine also plays, like, a censor for the Corky <laughs> Collins show. Yes. <laughs> Which was kind of like a double take. Hang on, hang on. I recognise that voice. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. weird, isn't it? Yeah. Havis Glenn Milstead was Divine's real name. And there's a lovely John Waters quote about Divine and gender where he says that if he's talking about Divine, the character in Multiple Maniacs or something, he always calls Divine her. But he says, I'm, Divine was never transgender. Divine never wanted to be a woman. Divine wanted to be a monster. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's weird that as well, considering that that was the first exposure I had to Divine. Mm. She plays this... She's much better actor in this. Mm. She's, her delivery is much less abrasive. Yeah. But she's like a really nice mum character. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And I think part of the DNA of Divine as a kind of drag persona is those kind of 1950s women's melodramas, the sort of uh, Douglas Sirk movies and things like that. So it's actually possible to drop her into a role where she's just a suburban housewife, and it works. Yeah. And it's such a bizarre sort of contrast when you consider these two films next to each other. Because the sort of the mum role of Divine in Multiple Maniacs is her daughter's basically a prostitute who sells drugs and she <laughs> couldn't be more proud. <laughs> and, and fast forward to uh, Hairspray and, yeah, it's she's just a wholesome... I mean, the whole movie is incredibly wholesome until it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, her character is never anything but just sort of very earnest and lovely. The fascinating thing is, for all it's such a nice movie and for all it, it lacks the kind of transgressive material that the other John Waters films have, it never feels toned down. It always feels as, as freakish in its own way as his other yeah, films. I mean, it's like you're one wrong corner away from the characters of his previous films. Like yeah. There's a scene where the kids run away from uh, the mad mum <laughs> and... <laughs> And and Divine, actually, and they're going to this uh, reefer heads. Oh, I yes. love the reefer heads. And that's that's a scene from an earlier John Waters movie, absolutely. <laughs> that's that's Pia Zadora as the beatnik woman, which is... <laughs> I mean, she, she was a sort of kitsch icon of the 80s. There's a famous urban myth about Pia Zadora when she started out that she was so bad that she once starred in a production of the Divey of Anne Frank and someone in the audience shouted, she's in the attic! Oh. 
That's unlucky. Yeah, <laughs> she was not well liked, but you put her in, in something like this and it's delightful. I love that little cameo. I think she's hilarious in it. Yeah, so it, it does, it feels sort of like the worlds are all aligned in this one. Yeah. You could accuse it of uh, John Waters being mainstream, but I don't think it is that mainstream really no it's still got this kind of i mean the whole thing comes from this uh local tv show in baltimore called what what was it called the buddy dean show which he was absolutely Mm. obsessed with as a kid and which did have a sort of secret segregation policy so it still belongs to this kind of subterranean world of weird, kitschy things that John Waters is obsessed about. It just expresses it in a different way. Yeah, but honestly, all, all told, I kind of loved it. Yeah, I loved it too. I think some of the dance numbers watching it now made me think, this is John Waters' version of Lover's Rock by Steve McQueen. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this is. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Uh, it was a few too many dance numbers, but it's a dance movie, so you can't really hold that against it. Yeah, but, yeah. It's it's just the personality involved and the the antagonist, uh, the the kid who sort of is uh, the rival of Ricky Lake. It's just such a horrible little monster. Yeah, she really is. Yes, but it's also a real monster as well. So he's not like he's just pulling things out of thin air. These like the mum character. Mm. This is a person who existed. Yeah, absolutely. I think in the mum character is kind of the one thing that I was kind of disappointed with in the musical remake, which mostly follows this pretty closely. But I said that the stage show premiered in 2002, which means that yeah. the bomb joke, America was not ready for comedy terrorism <laughs> at that point, which is a shame because no. I love that bit. No, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's fab really, Hairspray. And uh, I've added all of the other things save for uh, Pink Flamingos to me watch list on Letterbox. Yes. So I'm looking forward to catching up and getting through that. Wonderful. And if that's not the purpose of this show, I don't know what is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Find new artists, fill in your watch list. Be careful what you wish for. Is that the minister of the Wee Mission says? Well, is your next chance? We have to do a project about the moon landing. But did those boys not come back from that? They did. Now we have to cut things out of the papers and explain how they got there. If they did get there, they did get to the moon. It's not what it says here. God doesn't like it. And I watched every night too that they were up there. And how did I never see Mike Collins in the mothership doing his orbit? Surely you would have seen the sheep of Columbus against the light of the moon. No, that's because mostly he was on the dark side. Exactly, it's the side that Lucifer hangs his shillelagh. Well, no, he was on the dark side of the moon most of the time where we couldn't see him. You know, when he was doing his orbit and then maybe, you know, just before he was due to come around the corner, you had to go in for your tea. If I could come up with something smart about that, maybe I could stay up at the top desk and wait till she gets back there. Or you could say the moon's made of green cheese and drop down a place. Or you could do the project together, you and the young lady. You get the same marks and maybe end up on the same seat together. But how do you even talk to her? How to handle oh. a woman? There's a way, said the wise old man. <coughs> a way known by every woman since the whole rigmarole. Yes, all yeah. rigmarole with you, mister. Just jumping in again before the final stretch of the show. Uh, usually this would be the bit where we talk about movies that we, we'd like to talk about outside of the, the featured director. So instead of that, um, because this is an episode that was originally recorded in February 2021, to just translate that over here, hook, line and sink it, it wouldn't make an awful lot of sense because, you know, just, I hate to word it like this, but it's the only real way to phrase it, but our culture kind of moves on. So instead of cutting across a part which is out of date, which is comically out of date, or cutting the episode much, much shorter, instead, this is section that we're going to hear now is from the upcoming episode from Patreon, a preview, a Patreon preview if you like, uh, shared between me and Aidan F, um, where we don't talk about Lee Chang Dong, that bit is still behind the paywall, but we do talk about some of the movies that we've been talking, uh, looking at recently, not all of them, there's still some left over, there's still some of the section left over on the Patreon, so we don't take all of it, 
So without any further distraction, let's hand over to myself and Aiden, shall we? Now that leads us to the last part of the show in which we talk about uh, some of the movies that we've been watching away from podcasting recently. So, I mean... And normally, we probably use the segment to wax lyrical about films that we've seen. Oh, go on, not if something's drove you mad. <laughs> By other means. And I'm going to do precisely that, so um, I'm going to talk Belfast. Oh, that's unexpected. <laughs> Did not like it at all. It's just like... And I could, I could get where Kenneth Branagh's trying to do. I mean, he's obviously trying to make like a very personal film for his upbringing in Northern Ireland. But at the same time... You know, it, it's not really given me a reason to care about it. Yeah. So it's it's for me, it just felt like a here's a pile on of like uh, memories of his that obviously are dramatized to effect because you have to do that for like a, a drama. Yeah. But it 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 just I didn't get a sense of who these characters were really. I it didn't really give him much of a reason to care, and really you just get like an awful lot of schmaltz. Uh, like compact into here <laughs> that just honestly is very unappealing I mean, to me. I've not seen it, but to me it just looks like nostalgia porn <laughs> it's probably it's like that there's a bit very early on like it, how it opens the film it feels like the St- belfast tourism committee stapled an advert for belfast right at the very top it's like a lot of gliding <laughs> shots past the titanic museum like above like the, the terrace housing um, drawn shots of that it's just like what the hell I is i don't know this? if you've seen it but i think there was a movie from a few years back uh with shesha ronan i think it was called brooklyn Yes, we did. That was like one of the very first, very early eclectic as yeah. we did as film of the week. I remember that um, Belfast makes me think of that, but it seems like Brooklyn did a better job of it. I would agree. Yeah, I think Brooklyn, whilst like you know, is a perfectly lovely film. I mean, I don't have anything against Brooklyn, but it, it's not like a film that's going to like tear down the barriers of time and people losing their minds over with Belfast. I, it just annoyed me more than anything. <laughs> I can tell you the moment where it really did annoy me, where. Um, it was, I think, the moment where um, I think Buddy and like this girl that she's he's hanging around with. Uh, Buddy, by the way, is like the lead uh, kid protagonist, basically like the dramatic equivalent of like Kenneth Branagh oh, yeah. if he was in yeah. that situation as a kid. Um, it's where they gone to, go to ring, rob a corner shop, and the little uh, then the the lady kid um, asks buddy what chocolate he stole and, and he said oh yeah turkish delight and she's and she just bellows out well nobody likes turkish delight and then i'm just sat there thinking i'm offended from that i absolutely adore the stuff you're in a you're in a minority there you do realize that <laughs> <laughs> i know i do but at the same time it, no it's, it's a it, unfortunately it's a film that really didn't enjoy that's a pity i think i'll pick that um, up on up there and talk about something i did enjoy but i think uh-huh. I think maybe as a movie is the wrong medium for it. Um, it was in the mm. festival circuit last year. I think it's on Shudder now. Uh, Woodlands, Dark and Days Bewitched, A History of Folk Horror. I did hear Cliff uh, bring this up in his top 10 uh, for 2021, yeah. didn't he? I think it's three hours and 20 minutes. Which, I mean, cool. wow. <laughs> I mean, sitting through that is very, very hard work. But as far, it, it's it'd be a great BBC4 series. Um, it has these very, very knowledgeable people talking about, uh, in an academic level, what, what mm-hmm. folk horror means and what these folk horror things are. And it's fascinating. Yeah. And just seeing these movies that you never heard about before and maybe looking at certain things in a different perspective, it's an absolutely fascinating um, film movie, a like documentary thing. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not a great fan of them because... You know, I think they're kind of self-indulgent and glorified DVD extras. Yeah. But this isn't. This, it's kind of high watermark for this style of uh, film. Yeah. Because there's uh, there's an awful lot of that. There's some stuff like that going on at the moment. I mean, at the moment, I'm looking at my second room collection. There's that um, what, Czech cinema documentary. Mm. It's about nearly five hours long. I know, grave, Grim raved about that. He did, that, yeah. So. Well, Checkmate, is it called something? I think, yeah, Checkmate. So, um... I'm very much. I mean, to be honest, like documentaries about cinema. I mean, let's be fair. I really do enjoy yeah. them. That I have a soft spot for them. Even the Mark Cousins stuff. And I know Mark Cousins does get a lot of schlack because of how how he talks in his documentaries and get, he gets a lot of mockery for it. But at the same time, I, I kind of do like them. Yeah. I do have a soft spot for this them. This is a fabulous one. I'll be honest. I mean, I will, when it comes yeah. out in Blu-ray, which I really hope it does, I will be snapping it right up. It's just one of those. Uh, it's like I don't know if you saw it, but the uh, Mark Gattis documentaries he did about horror 
Oh, yes. I really enjoy that's, those. It's exactly that same sort of, oh, this is lovely, sort of like, movie documentary. Yeah. I really hope he makes another one. Yeah. I would love to see him, like, tackle J-Horror or something oh, like that. Oh, God, don't put ideas in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Mark Atis, could you please make a doc... Yeah. <laughs> I'd be all for that, but yeah, uh, Woodland's Dark and Days Bewitched. If you get a chance to see it, it sounds like you get a great deal out of it in. Mm, definitely. Um, a film that I felt uh, a bit fine about. I mean, I don't know whether I'd say I'd fully love it. I mean, I probably more respected it more than I liked it, but Power of the Dog. Ah, uh, on the same hymn sheet there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, don't get me wrong. I mean, I think there's a lot of... Because it's Jane Campion's return to form. And, you know, Jane Campion's not a daughter or a director, for example, that I've had a lot of experience yeah. with. Um, so this is my first film from her. And I, I felt uh, somewhere in the middle. I mean, how did you feel about it? It's like... Um, I just couldn't connect with it, really. Mm. It's one of these Westerns that's trying very, very, very hard to be, not be a Western. Mm, yeah. Because it's... I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, for a lot of comparisons, it's drawing a lot for There Will Be Blood. And I love There Will Be Blood. But the thing is, is that that's colourful fire in Brimstone. I think you need, like, a character, like, say, Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah. Um, to go that slightly bit over the edge to make it work. Cumberbatch isn't that, um, is he? Yeah. I mean, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I do like Cumberbatch an awful lot when he's given the right role with this. I mean, I, I just think he, he's fine. His performance is not bad. I just think there's not really much to latch onto other than being a horrible misogynistic shit. <laughs> well, some time, some people are just just have that, and that's their life. In <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> it's it's um, okay. I mean, I, I do like that um, Jesse Plemons is is really finding some cool yeah. roles for him to get behind because he's a great actor. I do. Yeah, yeah, I do completely agree. I think Jesse Plemons is just great in it. And Kirsten Dunst equally, I just think. They're an item as well. So oh, really? It does make sense for that. Yeah, they are They are together. Because yeah. they have great chemistry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's just completely natural for me. I, I do think there's way too little Thomas and Mackenzie in it, though. Um, mm. uh, I think that's one of my main points with it. But apart from that, you know, the New Zealand countryside is really lovely shot. It's very lushly painted. In broad strokes um but then again it's it, it's not a film that's gonna you know change my mind about anything it's uh, i just think yeah it's completely fine it's a good awards for the sort of movie does the yeah. job i mean I, I i liked it more than belfast <laughs> i can give it that <laughs> well it, at least this we've not had a extremely loud and you know extremely close and incredibly loud that was like as far as award bit films that's the one which has annoyed me more than any of in my entire life yeah yeah, that's the that's the film where it uses like what was it painted Asperger's yeah, as well as combine that with the Twin Towers attacks and it's just like it's Hollywood oh. trying to understand Asperger's and autism and getting it completely wrong in every conceivable way. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any time for films like that. It's just like no, no, there's there's a limit, and I think the limit's there mm. really. Um, my next one uh, is. One that's been out released recently from uh, Arrow Video, and it's my first ever, let's get his name right, uh, Yasujo Masamura movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it's Red Angel. Wasn't Masamura, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't he one of those directors who um, did a lot of Yakuza films in the 60s and 70s? I think he's more a satire. I think he might have done some Yakuza. Right, He's okay. got like a very, 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 very big filmography, like a lot of those guys tended to have. Mm, yeah. Um, but this one's an anti-war movie. Um, okay. about a, a nurse who works on the front line. So I don't think I need to fill in the blanks of what sort of movie it's like. Uh, it's about a nurse who's like, ferried between the front line and the Japanese-China war and back to uh, barracks. And she's she called her uh, the Red Angel, basically, because she's a nurse of death. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Um, she, through her decision to keep hold of her morality, she keeps on being responsible for people dying essentially mm -hmm. and yeah, it's incredibly yeah. bleak and i have a hard time with anti-war movies i know they're like war movies for people who don't like war movies mm -hmm. yeah but still so very macho aren't they usually yeah because i'm thinking about because i remember stanley kubrick made two war films and one of them you know you look at paths of glory that's his like anti-war yeah. film and you look at Full Metal Jacket, and then that is his war film. And they're two completely different, separate sides to him. And, you know, like I said, as Rob says, sometimes you can get that very maturely. And I do like both of those films plenty. It's, it's just like, you know, a matter of um, how it splits itself. Yeah. 
Fred Angel, though, I mean, I think it's great. It has to be in black and white because it's got countless shots of people having legs amputated. Oh, um, there's oh, like one okay. bit of... I mean, it's 1960, so I don't think the effects would hold up particularly well if it was in colour. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, with um, this, I think the problem with it, is it does take a female perspective, but at the same time it has... I don't think it works particularly well because the theme, the, the lead character, Ayako, uh, I don't know what's her name, uh, actors' names, uh, where are we? It's uh, Ayako Wako. Um, she falls okay. in love with the Doctor. And I think, mm-hmm. I, I don't like that, how kind of belittling, maybe, if you follow me, me, me line yeah. of thought. Yeah, when, you, when you're talking about an anti-war flair where, like you say, you get people like having their like limbs amputated, it, it, it's probably... You know, the last thing you'd expect. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes for a really weird uh, melodramatic um, sort of uh, undercurrent there. And there's also a bit where an entire barracks on the, the front line in China uh, comes down with, oh, I can't remember the illness, but it effectively kills the entire camp. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's just, oh, it's just so much death. It's, it's a great anti-war movie, but at the same time, I think the mark of an anti-war movie being great, and I think you experienced it too, watching The Human Condition, and this is exactly, oh, exactly yeah. the same cloth. It's just hard. It's a hard film. And don't get me wrong, I love The Human Condition, but The Human Condition, Jesus Christ, it's like you're talking about nine hours worth of that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think this is an hour and 45, so it's not manageable, but it's grim, this stuff. Hmm. But again, again, I, I have a I have a huge fondness for Mizaki Kobayashi. I just think he's like one of the great Japanese filmmakers that were, wasn't that wasn't really. He didn't really get his uh, celebration, did he, internationally? And that's it for this week. Um, you can find my co-host. Uh, for the majority of the show, I was talking to Graham Williamson, who you can find on letterbox by searching for his name um he's also on twitter at graham w films or you can check him out on horrified magazine or pop screen the pop screen podcast where he talks about movies that feature pop stars in some prominent role outside of the score uh, aiden you can find on just on letterbox at aiden f so that's where you'll find them. You'll find me at underscore RJ Simpson on Twitter and Instagram and just search for my full name on Letterbox and you will find me there. That's uh, Robert Simpson or Rob Simpson. Why did I say my full name? I'm not in trouble, am I? Um, thank you for listening to this latest episode of Directors Uncut and we will see...